Right. Hi. Oh, please. Yeah, we're, we're so excited about this topic. We're both talking at the same time. It's a big <laughs> one. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Terry Corkfriend, and I am the state rep for District 72, and I represent the southern half of Portsmouth and the eastern side of Middletown all the way down to Second Beach, Statuist Point, just to give you some geographical context. Yeah, a truly beautiful stretch of the state. There's really no question about it. Um, I read now from a, a press release that came from the General Assembly's uh, Public Relations Office, and I'll read it in part here. Visiting the Ocean State's 400 miles of shoreline this summer just got a little bit more relaxing. Legislation to more clearly delineate the public area of the shore has been signed into law by Governor McKee. The new law establishes that the public area of the shoreline ends and private property begins at 10 feet landward of a recognizable high tide line. The law is intended to finally provide a clear, easily identifiable border between private property and the area of the shore that the public is constitutionally entitled to use and enjoy. And of course, that's the Rhode Island state constitution, which does provide that provision as well as the right to gather seaweed, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. and, and Rep, this is something that has been sort of an ongoing saga of sorts for years. And there really has been a lack of clarity. It's led to some protests. I think of Scott Keeley, who protested by setting up shop on the beach in what was an unclear area. Is it private? Is it public? Um, and ultimately he was arrested. There's been many other controversies around this. Talk about the legislation that you sponsored, co-sponsored, and, and where we are right now in terms of accessing our beautiful shoreline. To be honest, I was kind of ignorant uh, to the whole issue until Scott Keeley got arrested. And then some people sent it to me because they thought I would be interested in the perspective of a sea level rise because they knew I was passionate about that. And I was frustrated that the General Assembly wasn't really talking about sea level rise. But that kind of got, got me into understanding the whole um, that we have this constitutional right that um, it, it it tells you tells Rhode Islanders exactly what they can do, but it never really said where they could do it, and um, and that has really been the epitome of the problem. And so I was fortunate enough that the speaker allowed me to chair a study commission, which um, got quite a bit of uh, press coverage. And we had a lot of expert testimony. We heard from the public. We went down to South County, in fact, and had one night down there and heard from a lot of different people came out that night. Um, we heard from property owners, CRMC, um, uh, scholars, lawyers, uh, professors, historical professors, uh, and the coastal scientists down from URI, from the Coastal Institute. And they were probably the most moving that really persuaded the members of the commission that the line that we're using, that we had been using, the old line, the Ibison line on the southern shore is underwater, you know, 80% of the time, maybe more. Some days there was no shore for Rhode Islanders to legally walk on. And that really moved even the people that initially were skeptics on the commission. And um, people thought the members of the commission felt very strongly that Rhode Islanders should be able to have a dry strip of sand to walk on along the shore. And that's kind of how we came to the bill. And then there was some negotiating back and forth between the version that the House passed and then the version that the Senate passed. And so uh, now we have a new law and we, we have, have a great line. We have a definable line. <laughs> We have a new law, and with that will we'll inevitably come some lack of understanding of the law. There'll be some additional controversy, without a doubt, unless somehow we can, through, I don't know, telepathy, get this into everybody's brain up front here. But, but it establishes really important guidelines. And a lot of people, look, there's, there's controversy sometimes around rights of way, uh, the fire districts. I mean, this, this is a very nuanced question. But then there's also some basic things. An example in Newport would be the stretch of Bailey's Beach and, of course, the abutting Rejects Beach, where us 
plebeian folks are going to go bathe. Um, you, you can access rejects from the shoreline, but you're also, of course, permitted to go down across that artificial dividing line onto Bailey's Beach so long as you are beneath the newly established provision. That's just one example um, right. of, of something that you could do. And a lot of people will say, whether it's Watch Hill, the Dunes Club, Bailey's Beach Club, they'll try to chase you out of there anyway. So it's going to be really interesting to see some of the testimony that may have occurred or didn't occur, but is sort of implied opposition from folks who have private either beach clubs or, of course, private property, as we often see, whether it's Green Hill or on East, uh, East Matunic or anywhere along the shoreline. Yes, it's going to be interesting. I do imagine that there'll be a court case. Um, I think the members of the study commission were anticipating that. Um, I know my colleague in the Senate, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people that have been involved in this anticipate that there'll be some kind of a court case and we hope that the language that we put into the bill and we were I'm not a lawyer personally sometimes I've wished many times during this process that I was but I'm not but uh, there were many lawyers involved that were experts on in this field and uh, they feel that we have the, the way we crafted the language and the findings that we put into the bill were all aimed at surviving a constitutional challenge in the courts. Right. And then there may probably be other things that I think the courts might need to interpret, like the Constitution. Like if you are, the Constitution says you're allowed to bathe, swim from the shore. Um, does that mean you can bring a towel and put it down in that 10 foot section? Uh, if you're fishing from the shore, can you bring your chair? Can you bring your cooler? Um, I think those things, the study commission talked about them, and we felt like it really wasn't the role of the legislature to interpret the Constitution. We felt like, let's just use the language in the Constitution, in the statute now, and, you know, the courts will have to figure out, make an interpretation from there. Right. And it'll be interesting to see both private sector and municipal regulations or guidelines around this, because at the end of the day, it should be consistent from Westerly to Warren. And whether it is or not will will probably come down, as you said, to some court challenges. I wonder about the travel of this bill. What made it work this year? What's the big difference between this legislative session and previous efforts? Because this is again, this isn't like a brand new crisis or anything like that. This has been floating around for a while. Why did it get through this year? Uh, well, uh, last year I didn't have a Senate sponsor, so I'll say that's why it didn't happen last year. The study commission um, uh, ended its work late in the session and it was later, you know, past the deadline, and the rules in the Senate were a little bit different than the rules in the House. So we had that 7D rule where you can put a bill in late. So I was able to do that, but I couldn't find, I couldn't, the Senate didn't have that same rule. So that wasn't available. Uh, so that's why I didn't pass last year. But I think after the work of the study commission and the report that came out and and the fact that uh, we were, uh, Senator McKinney, McKinney was reelected to his seat and he had served on the, on the study commission. So, um, he was able to introduce it on the Senate. And I think because he was on the commission, he that gave him some additional credibility and with his colleagues. And uh, I was really grateful that that happened the way it did. And um, that uh, I think that all contributed to it being it passing this year. And I think since COVID, uh, there's just been more of an appreciation for the outdoors and for being able to have, uh, you know, access, all kinds of outdoor access has just become more top of mind with people. And I think a lot of that had to do with COVID and the whole get outside efforts campaign. Definitely. Another aspect of this that may come up in future legislation or may again be something municipal is rights of way. I mentioned them before. I think of Ken Block, who has sort of rigorously mapped out rights of way in Barrington that are now really just blockaded. We see some of this nonsense in Newport, where I, I can picture some folks who put up 
homemade sawhorse signs uh, near Bailey's Beach to sort of suggest, well, this is a private road, you know, even though it's a public road and there's a, a shoreline access right of way there. So do you see additional legislation coming down in, in future sessions that may further describe the public's right to access the, the shore, not just looking at it from a shoreline perspective, but also getting to the shoreline itself? I think uh, I think so. Um, I don't think that's beyond the realm of possibility. I know a lot of people uh, thought that this that we should have another study commission on perpendicular uh, access. The first one was definitely um, very specific that it was about lateral access. So the the bill, the legislation assumes that you have gotten to the shore through a legal right away. Um, Senator Gu had a bill and I had the companion in the house for uh, illegal signage to deal with that issue. I think um, maybe I've talked to colleagues that maybe um, real estate disclosures when you buy a piece of shoreline property that you would have to sign, you know, one of those disclosures, like all that big stack of paper that you sign when you close on a house, that one of them would be an awareness of the state law on access, beach access for the public. Um, I think there could be other things. You know, people have asked me about ponds and, and that, I think this is more about shore, saltwater shore. And, um, but uh, so uh, uh, Chairman McNamara in the house had some bills around access around um, rivers and, um, and maybe ponds. So in paths using uh, like, historically um, used pass. Uh, he had some bills around that. So I think, you know, one bill has cropped up a, a lot of ideas around the idea of access. So I could see more legislation in future sessions. Yes. Yeah. And also not only purchasing a home, but then passing that on because we see sometimes with renters um, or even sometimes you'll see Airbnbs that are advertised private beach. Right. And you go, yeah. well, kind of, but, but not really. really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rep, yes. thank you so much for your work on this. I think that the state as a whole really appreciates it. I know I do as someone who loves to go to the ocean and, and has been just upset by some of the nonsense that goes that, that some people try to deploy when governing the shoreline. So it is much appreciated. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks for talking about it because education is a big component of this. And so the more we can get the word out there to uh, the people, public uh, beachgoers and uh, property owners, I think the better so that we can, everybody can be informed. So I really appreciate you taking up the topic. Of course.